everyone uh, to the second day of programs. Uh, we have two sessions as we had yesterday. Uh, very interesting line of speakers. Our first speaker is Professor He O from Yale University, and she will speak on unipotent flows on hyperbolic manifolds. So, Professor O, is yep. over to you. Over to you now. Okay, thank you. Oh, I hope you can hear me clearly because my mic actually, I, I, I don't hear actually very loudly. No, can you hear is, me clearly? It is, it is extremely clear. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. So uh, first, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me uh, to speak on this delightful occasion and happy birthday, Raghunadan. So, uh, yeah, of course, Raghunadan made many, many important contributions in mathematics, but I think one can say that actually his conjecture on topological rigidity for unipotent flows on homogeneous spaces has basically started this area of homogeneous dynamics. And uh, this conjecture also had a tremendous influence on my own research. So, so as well known actually, so this conjecture uh, now fully established by Marina Ratno. So it has had many uh, striking applications uh, and beginning with the, actually the proof of open eye conjecture by Magulis. So, uh, so today actually, so I want to discuss actually one geometric implication of this conjecture on horror cycles uh, on closed hyperbolic manifolds. And then uh, I'll try to present a class of infinite volume hyperbolic manifolds where we have a similar topological rigidity theorem. Okay. So I'll begin with actually very simple classical theorem uh, about lines in the torus. So by torus here, two torus is simply uh, R2 divided by Z2, so the integral lattice. So, I mean, uh, clearly we have this quotient map from R2 to T2. Uh, and by line in the torus, I simply mean the projection of a line in R2 under this quotient map. So in R2, of course, the older line is closed. It's just, it's just a line. But, uh, but now if you go to the actual projection, uh, then the theorem says that some lines uh, are either, I mean, any line is either closed or dense in this, uh, in this torus T2. And this is known as Kronecker theorem in 1884. And we can actually say even more precisely, so it, whether the line is closed or dense, uh, it is precisely determined by the slope of line. If the slope uh, is rational, then the line uh, projects to a simple closed curve in T2. And if the slope is irrational, then we get actually, we get uh, this, uh, I mean, dense object in T2. I mean, this statement and the proof is very simple because the, actually the symmetry Z2 is very simple to understand. So now well, we can also uh, go to higher dimensional uh, picture for this. So again, if you consider now n dimensional torus, which is Rn uh, divided by Zn, then again, like we can consider uh, the line in this torus, which is again, the image of a line in Rn uh, to this Tn via the projection map. And, and now actually, so it's not true anymore that we have a closed or dense dichotomy, but however, uh, the close of every line is a sub torus in Tn. So it's a very nice object. Okay. So uh, this is very classical and then easy to prove. And then the, the easy to prove uh, is because actually the ZN is uh, not, I mean, abelian group is very simple to understand. So now I want to discuss actually similar phenomena now for hyperbolic surface. Okay. So uh, to discuss hyperbolic surface, so I want to use this uh, above space model, a pop plane model. So my H2 is going to be just uh, above the X axis. So, so it consists of X comma Y with a positive Y. And then the hyperbolic metric uh, in this uh, pop plane model is the Euclidean metric divided by the Y coordinate here. Okay. So here, uh, now we consider these horizontal lines. So if I consider the horizontal line, then because the Y coordinate is fixed. So if I restrict my hyperbolic metric to this horizontal line, then this line is simply Euclidean line because this Y is fixed. So we just get the Euclidean line. So I would like to consider these horizontal lines in this uh, pop space model as Euclidean lines. So this is why I wrote Euclidean lines okay, in hyperbolic plane. So these Euclidean lines in H2 are also called horocycles. 
So now, uh, what is hyperbolic surface? So hyperbolic surface uh, is simply uh, complete. So when I say hyperbolic surface, it will be always complete hyperbolic surface. And complete hyperbolic surface can be presented as the quotient of H2 by a discrete subgroup of PSL2R. Okay? Because PSL2R uh, is an isometry group of H2. So any hyperbolic surface can be presented as H2 over gamma. And uh, S is closed precisely when gamma is a co-compact lattice in PSL2R. So that we have the quotient surface, a compact surface. Okay? So now uh, I have a closed hyperbolic surface S and by a horocycle in S that I simply mean the projection of this horizontal line or horocycle in H2 under this quotient map. Okay? So the question uh, analogously uh, as before, so what are the closures of uh, this horocycle in S? So this is a well-known theorem of Hedlund in 1936. So whenever uh, we have a closed hyperbolic surface S, any horocycle, so meaning the projection of any this horizontal line uh, to this S is always dense. Okay. So this is Hedlund's theorem. And uh, I want to remark that, so this is actually very far from uh, being true for geodesics. So in hyperbolic plane, so horizontal lines are horocycles and then uh, the vertical lines are geodesics. But uh, it's very well known that actually in closed hyperbolic surface, the closure of geodesic can be as chaotic as we wish. So there is no way that actually, uh, no way to hope for any kind of topological rigidity for geodesics. So this statement is something very special about horocycles. So, uh, so how did Hedlund actually prove this statement? So instead of looking at the surface, he looked at the unit tangent bundle. So, the group PSL2R acts, of course, in H2 by Melvius transformations. And then this action is, uh, is transitive, but it's not simply transitive if you look at the action on H2. However, if you look at the action of PSL2R on the unit tangent bundle of H2, then this action is simply transitive and transitive. So this gives identification of unit tangent bundle of H2 with the PSL2R. And also the identification of H2 by gamma. So my S is H2 mod gamma. Uh, so unit tangent bundle of S uh, is exactly this homogeneous space PSL2R mod gamma. Okay. So now uh, we want to consider this one parameter unipotent subgroup. So consisting of this uh, upper triangular matrix 1T01. Okay. So, uh, so I said unipotent subgroup, so a subgroup is called unipotent if it consists only of unipotent matrices and then a matrix is unipotent. It means uh, that uh, all the eigenvalues of this matrix are exactly ones. So of course here, uh, these are unipotent matrices. Okay? So here we have a one parameter unipotent subgroup. So uh, what's the relation between horocycle and this unipotent subgroup? The thing is that uh, every horocycle actually corresponds to a U orbit. So uh, let's go back to this picture. So here I have this one horocycle. So if I take uh, any, say, uh, upward normal vector to this horocycle, and then, uh, so I said actually, so T1 of H2 is PSL2R. So this the tangent vector here is, a, is an element in PSL2R. And then now if I look at the U orbit of this tangent vector, it gives uh, all the this upward normal vectors based on this horocycle. So therefore, if I understand actually the closure of U orbits on the unit tangent bundle, so this will give uh, us actually this description of the closures of horocycles on the hyperbolic surface. Okay. So what Hadland proved is actually uh, this is a stronger version. So what he showed is that for every vector on the unit tangent bundle, so in other words, for every point uh, X in PSL2R mode gamma, the closure of XU uh, is everything. So it fills up actually uh, all the unit tangent bundle. So in particular, this implies that every horocycle is dense okay, in the hyperbolic surface. Okay, so now uh, I want to consider a higher dimensional version of this uh, uh, Hedron theorem. So Euclidean lines in closed hyperbolic and manifold. So, so Again, like I want to look at the a pop space model of the hyperbolic n space. So now here Hn, so this is the uh, above the uh, plane given by y is equal to zero. So y will be my last coordinate. And then again, the hyperbolic metric uh, on this a pop space model is the Euclidean metric divided by the last coordinate in y. 
So for the same reason, now if I consider any horizontal line, okay, so, it's, so it has to be a line or uh, line on some horizontal plane. So any horizontal line is a Euclidean line because if I restrict uh, my hyperbolic metric, the y coordinate is fixed, so it's just a Euclidean line. Okay, so uh, I call these horizontal lines horocycles in HN. And now, uh, again, like complete hyperbolic, any complete hyperbolic manifold can be presented as the quotient of HN by gamma, where gamma is uh, some torsion free discrete subgroup S, so n, comma, one. Okay, so the, the reason why this uh, special orthogonal group appears is because S, so n, comma, one is precisely isometry group of HN. And this manifold, this quotient manifold M is closed exactly when gamma is a co compact lattice in SON, comma one, so that I have some compact here uh, hyperbolic manifold. So, as before, uh, by a horocycle or Euclidean line in this closed hyperbolic manifold, I mean the projection of this horizontal line or horocycle uh, under this quotient map. Okay? So, what are the possible images here? So, uh, so this is a theorem uh, of now Ratna and also proved by uh, Char independently around the 1990. Uh, so the theorem says the following. Uh, if M is any closed hyperbolic manifold, then uh, the closure of any horocycle is always a properly merged submanifold. I mean, so, so this is very analogous actually uh, to the case of Kronecker theorem about uh, the any line in a, and dimensional torus is a sub torus okay? because I can say it even more precisely. So, what are the possible properly immersed sub manifold? So, we can say even more precisely. So, more precisely, uh, the closure of a horocycle will be a properly immersed totally geodesic sub manifold of M up to some translation. Okay. So, if my hyperbolic closed hyperbolic manifold M does not have any proper properly immersed totally geodesic submanifold, then every horocycle will be dense as in this picture. Okay? So it's possible that some manifold actually uh, does not have any properly immersed totally geodesic submanifold, then every horocycle is dense over there. On the other hand, if this manifold happens to have some properly immersed totally geodesic submanifold, then this submanifold will contain uh, some horocycles, a lot of horocycles, and then these horocycles, of course, cannot get out of uh, this properly immersed submanifold. They can only be dense here. Okay? That is as much as they can do. And then what the theorem says that these are the all the possibilities up to translations. Okay? So the close of any horocycle is a properly immersed total geodesic submanifold of M up to translation. So how does one prove this theorem? So this theorem is in fact a uh, special case of Ratner's theorem uh, conjectured by Raghunathan. So this is the statement of Raghunathan's conjecture uh, made, I think, in late 70s. So let G be a connected linear Lie group. So I just want to think of the matrix group. So I put linear here. So G consists of matrices. So for instance, G can be SLNR or this uh, special orthogonal group SON, comma one, and so on. And let gamma be a lattice in G. So meaning that gamma is a discrete subgroup of a finite volume. So this homogeneous space G mod gamma has finite volume. So we consider this uh, quotient space G mod gamma. And of course, any subgroup uh, H of G acts on this G mod gamma. But we are going to consider a uh, connected unipotent subgroup. So again, uh, I think I already said that a subgroup is called a unipotent if it only consists of unipotent matrices. Okay? Then, uh, then here's a statement of Ragnada's conjecture uh, proved by Ratner in 1991 in full generality. So for every X in G mod gamma, the closure uh, of XU, the U orbit of X, is a homogeneous space of another Lie group containing U. So the closure of XU is equal to XH for some connected closed subgroup H containing U. Okay. So yeah, so this is the famous uh, Ragnarok's conjecture. So I like to say that actually, so it's not very hard uh, using ergodic theorem to prove that in fact, almost all, for almost all points, X in G mod gamma, the U will be this dense in G mod gamma. So in particular, the, the closure of XU will be the all of G mod gamma. 
But however, actually, the power of this uh, conjecture and theorem is about actually this conjecture describes the orbit of every point. So under U action. Okay? So this almost all result does not dis describe actually uh, the behavior of a, a very specific point given. But however, this conjecture lists all the possibilities. Okay, so. Uh, Ratna proved this conjecture using her major rigidity result. Uh, but before Ratna, actually, some important special cases were proved by uh, Magulis and Dani Magulis and Shah using topological approach. So I want to mention that. And now, uh, the special case of this theorem, uh, how is this related to the behavior of horror cycles? So we apply this theorem for the case when g is equal to SON, which is a Lie group. Uh, and n is at least two. Uh, now, so remember, so we had a closed hyperbolic manifold which was of the form Hn mod gamma, and then gamma is a co-compact lattice in SON comma one. Okay? And then this SON comma one mod gamma, this is actually precisely the frame bundle of the hyperbolic manifold Hn mod gamma. Okay? When n is equal to two for hyperbolic surface, uh, the homogeneous space was uh, simply the, the unit tangent bundle, but if you go to higher n, uh, actually is more than the unit tangent bundle, it is in fact the frame bundle. Okay? So, but we have actually this nice quotient map from the frame bundle to HN mod gamma, but this, uh, considering this frame bundle is nice because any subgroup of SON comma one can act on this quotient space by translation. Okay? Whereas actually in the manifold, there is no action except for finite groups. So, uh, I mean, as before, uh, so now every horror cycle in HN mod gamma, this is always covered by uh, an orbit of some one dimensional unipotent subgroup in SON comma one. And now this Raghunadans conjecture says that the closures of this XU, uh, these are nice manifolds. Uh, so therefore the closure of horror cycles is also nice manifolds. Okay? So this is how this uh, statement about uh, topological rigidity of a horror cycle is related to this uh, conjecture. Okay, so yeah, so actually, uh, so I said all of this actually to motivate this following question. So the, my question now is that, uh, what about in the infinite volume setting? So would Raghunadan's conjecture uh, can still hold in the infinite volume setting? So this is the question. And uh, in a complete generality, the answer is no, because actually it's not very hard actually to find uh, some hyperbolic three manifold, for instance, uh, which is the product of uh, which is homeomorphic to the uh, hyperbolic surface times R, uh, which also, which contains actually horror cycles with very wide closures. Okay. Uh, one can, so in this hyperbolic surface, actually, there is many uh, geodesics with wide closures, and then one can somehow promote these geodesics to geodesic planes, and then these geodesic planes actually will contain some horror cycles uh, with wild closures. So, in general, actually, so in a complete generality, one cannot remove this uh, hypothesis gamma is a lattice inside the G. But however, uh, uh, there are certain class of actually hyperbolic manifolds of infinite volume, uh, which we call convex for compact hyperbolic manifolds with the Fuchsian end, where we have a similar rigidity theorem for horror cycles. So this is what I want to explain now. So for n is equal to two, actually for surface, every convex or compact surface has function end, and then uh, they are constructed in the following way. So take any uh, closed hyperbolic surface. You start with any closed hyperbolic surface, and then choose some simple closed geodesic. Any closed hyperbolic surface contains infinitely many simple closed geodesic. So take any simple closed geodesic, and then we cut uh, this hyperbolic surface along this simple closed geodesic. And then we'll get this uh, hyperbolic surface with two geodesic boundary components. Okay? So you cut here, and then we get this hyperbolic surface with the two geodesic boundary components. But this hyperbolic surface is not complete anymore. Okay? So to represent hyperbolic surface as a quotient of H2 by gamma, we, we need to have a complete hyperbolic surface. So I want to make it complete by gluing this function and to each geodesic component, okay? So, so because this uh, boundary is this simple closed geodesic, say, L, so I can glue 
L times R plus this, uh, this end component here, and then this hyperbolic surface now will become complete. Okay, so this is what I call convex compact hyperbolic surface with Fuchsian end. Uh, but here, so I gave an example with actually one simple closure that's it, but we can also do the same surgery with any finite many simple closure as long as they are disjoint. So you choose finite collection of uh, finite disjoint collection of simple closed geodesics and then cut the hyperbolic surface uh, along these simple closed geodesics. You might just have one or I mean, or you can have uh, several uh, hyperbolic surfaces with boundary components, but whenever you see geodesic boundary components, uh, you can glue this Fuchsian end and then make it complete. So then uh, you create this uh, uh, hyperbolic surfaces with the Fuchsian end. And any convex compact hyperbolic surface of this type, okay, in, in dimension two. Now in higher dimension, so if n is at least three, then first of all, most of rigidity theorem says that there are only countably many closed hyperbolic n manifolds, unlike in the surface case. Okay, so we have a, a countably infinitely many closed hyperbolic manifolds. And some of these closed hyperbolic manifolds uh, does not contain any properly embedded co-dimension one total geodesic sub manifold, but some will do. So in fact, actually, so there is a, uh, infinitely many closed hyperbolic manifolds, which contains uh, some properly embedded co-dimension one total geodesic sub manifold. So I will take them. Okay. So here is the illustration. So let's suppose this S is a properly embedded co-dimension one total geodesic manifold. And as before in the surface case, we are going to cut along this uh, uh, co-dimension one geodesic manifold and then obtain this hyperbolic manifold with a totally geodesic boundary component. Then we can again glue this uh, hyperbolic surface times R plus, which we call Fuchsian end, and obtain this complete hyperbolic end manifold. Okay, these are what we call this convex compact hyperbolic manifold with the Fuchsian end. So again, we can do with this actually uh, several uh, geodesic manifolds as long as they are disjoint. So if you have uh, this. Uh, Finitely many properly embedded co-dimension one total geodesic manifold, you can cut along this and then glue Fuchsian end whenever you see the boundary component. And then we get these hyperbolic manifolds and obviously they have an infinite volume, okay? So we also say that actually, we, also in, we can also include actually a convex or compact manifold with empty Fuchsian end. And empty Fuchsian end would mean that these are closed hyperbolic manifolds. Okay, so now uh, I can state this theorem. So let n be any convex co compact hyperbolic n manifold. So n, n is the two, of course, with the Fuchsian end. Okay, so again, like if it's empty Fuchsian end, it means it's a closed hyperbolic n manifold. Uh, and then if it's a non empty Fuchsian end, then uh, this has infinite volume. Then the theorem is that the closure of any horror cycle is again a properly immersed uh, hyperbolic sub manifold. So more precisely, uh, the closure of horror cycle can be itself. So this case did not occur in the closed uh, hyperbolic manifold case, but it can occur in the infinite volume hyperbolic case because some horror cycle just can stay in this Fuchsian end. Okay? And then uh, it will be possible. We, we can have some Euclidean line over here and then uh, they are closed and same as itself. And then uh, another possibility is that just like in the closed hyperbolic manifold case, the close of horror cycle will be a properly immersed totally geodesic sub manifold up to translation. Okay. So we have a complete analog of actually this uh, rigidity of horror cycles for this class of infinite volume hyperbolic manifolds. So when n is equal to two, so this, is, uh, this goes back to Darbo's result in 2000. Uh, and n is equal to three. Uh, this was a work uh, done jointly with McMullen and Muhammadi around 2016. And for higher dimensional hyperbolic manifold, uh, this uh, was done uh, in joint work with my former student, Min Julie. Okay. So how do we prove this theorem? So just like actually the topological rigidity of horror cycles for closed hyperbolic manifold actually was a consequence of Orbit closure theorem. So we also prove uh, uh, the statement about Orbit closures for the unipotent group action. Okay? So maybe uh, I think the good way to summarize this theorem is that 
uh, in this uh, in this setting, we prove that U orbit closures are relatively homogeneous. Okay, so now let me explain this terminology. So remember, so okay, so I start with uh, manifold which is convex or compact uh, hyperbolic manifold with the Fuchsian end. Okay, so this means that gamma is a discrete suborb so n one, uh, which has infinite covolume. Uh, whose associated hyperbolic manifold has this property, that's fiction end. And now let U be a unipotent, a connected unipotent subgroup of G, so n comma one. So in fact, actually, uh, it does not have to be unipotent. It can be any connected subgroup generated by unipotent elements. Okay? So it's the same generality actually as in Raghunadan's conjecture. So it can, you can be any connected subgroup generated by unipotent elements. For instance, it can be SO2 comma one. And then now for every X in G mod gamma, so uh, the closure of X to U intersection with uh, some object RFM, I'm going to explain it in a second, is equal to uh, orbit of uh, uh, XH, XH intersection RFM, where H is a sum closed least subgroup containing U and this XH is closed. So if we didn't have this RFM, this is exactly the same statement as in Raghunadan's conjecture. The closure of XU is equal to XH, where H is a sum connected group containing U. Okay? So now why do we have actually this intersection with RFM? Because without taking this intersection with RFM, the theorem is not true. It is false. But, uh, but actually this uh, intersection with RFM is harmless because actually this RFM uh, in fact, it's a short for renormalized frame bundle. This captures all the non-trivial dynamics of the hyperbolic manifold. So if one understands this intersection, then one understands everything. So it's very easy to recover what the closure of uh, XU has to be if one has this information. Okay. So, uh, okay, so I didn't explain yet what is RFM, but modulo that, uh, I hope actually this title uh, makes sense. The U orbit closures are relatively homogeneous, meaning that, so if I look at this U orbit closure in the ambient space RFM, so I replaced my ambient space G mod gamma with uh, uh, RFM, then in here it is homogeneous. The U orbit closure is homogeneous. So that's why I call the relative homogeneity. Okay, so now what is uh, RFM? So this is short for renormalized frame bundle. And I think this terminology was first used by Sullivan. So uh, remember I said the G mod gamma can be considered as the frame bundle of the hyperbolic uh, manifold. So instead of these points, so we have all the frames in this hyperbolic manifolds. And then when you have a frame, uh, the first vector will always determine geodesics in the hyperbolic manifold. And then the renormalized frame bundle consists of frames with bounded geodesics. So of course, if G mod gamma is compact, then uh, all the geodesics are bounded. So therefore RFM, renormalized frame bundle will be all of G mod gamma if it is compact. But uh, if it's not compact, then this RFM removes those geodesics uh, which shoots to infinity, okay? Okay, but it only captures uh, those geodesics. We don't mean these geodesics are closed, but just bounded, okay? So it only captures actually the frames which defines bounded geodesics. This is a highly fractal subset in G mod gamma. It's very, very far from being a manifold, but it's, it's, it's a fractal set. But however, this fractal set uh, captures actually all the non-trivial dynamics happening in G mod gamma. So in the infinite volume setting, somehow this is the, in some sense, the right object to look at it. Okay. One can also say that because this RFM is not homogeneous anymore. So that is why so some of the, or the main difficulty of actually working in this uh, dynamics in infinite volume space uh, occurs is this ambient space is not homogeneous in a sense. Okay, so I think my time is up even though I had two more slides. So I think I finished here. Yeah. Thank you and happy birthday again. Uh, thank, thank you very much, Professor O. Uh, we will take some questions. If anybody has questions, they can open their audio and video. Yeah, yeah, Professor Raghunathan, your your uh, audio is off. Can you can you unmute, please? Yeah. Yes. No, no, audio is off. Oh. 
Okay. Yeah. Hear me? Yeah. So what I want to know is, uh, is it possible to characterize elements in gamma with whose uh, which correspond to close to your six? No, not not close to your six. So which which correspond to bounded your six? Yes. No. Uh, elements in gamma. Elements in gamma give you close to your six, right? I'm sorry. No. Right. Right. So element yeah. of gamma gives a closed geodesic. We don't right. look at closed, right? Because there are only countably okay, many okay. closed geodesics. So right, it's right, not right. going to be interesting, but it's a bound. I meant bounded geodesic. Yeah. yeah. But is it possible to characterize uh, bounded geodesics uh, in terms of the group and gamma somehow? Right, it is hard, right. I, it's, I don't think, right, I mean, yeah, you can only say in G mode gamma, you look at this orbit of one dimensional diagonal group, and then if this orbit, you, you can say that it's the closer, uh, yeah, it's the union of all the bounded A orbits where, where A is the one dimensional diagonal group. Can, can I think of it as the closure? I think it's the same as the, yeah, it's the same as that you look at all the closed geodesics, union of all the closed geodesics, it's not closed. So you take on out closure. And I think it's the same thing. Okay. Yeah. So in fact, actually the closed geodesics are uh, equidistributed in this space. So another actually way to characterize this space is, is the so-called non-wandering set of the geodesic flow, actually. But to be precisely, I have to go to the frame below, frame boundary, yeah. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> okay, any other questions? Yes, can I ask a question? Yes, please, Sen Gupta. Yeah. yeah, I just wanted a clarification. You, in your, this, Towards the beginning, you gave the image of the horocycle in yes. manifold. You said something up to a translation. Now your, yes. ma uh, your manifold is already G mod, K mod, gamma. So what is the translation? Right. Uh, I was actually not very precise. So by translation, I meant that actually uh, it's... Uh, so you... So how do I say? So if I have an element actually which uh, normalizes you, then actually I can move. So it's actually yeah, easier yeah. to think this in G mode gamma space. So whenever you have some object that uh, that you preserve, so you can always move uh, this object by the normalizer of you, and then you is going to still preserve this object. So that's what I meant by translation. Yeah. But in terms of manifold, it is the same as that. Uh, it's a key distant actually translation of this geodesic submanifold. So I fix some distance t and then I move this object uh, by distance t everywhere. Then it's yeah. not going to be geodesic anymore, but it's going to be some manifold which uh, is still preserved by you actually uh, above. So that's what I meant. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what about the situation for complex hyperbolic space? I mean, if you work with SUN1, all the questions make sense, right? Yes, uh, the, yeah, the, the, I mean, uh, the Raghunadas conjecture Ratna theorem, this is completely general. Oh, so right. I'm talking about space, this right, uh, right. any one dimensional U orbit uh, has a still very nice closures, but uh, yeah, we don't have an analogous theorem uh, for infinite volume case. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah, in some sense it is, uh, I mean, the co-dimension one total due to sub manifold actually this plays very important role, not only in the statement, but also in the proof and then but somehow in the complex hyperbolic manifold, I don't think there is a yeah, uh, co-dimension one total to this sub manifold. So okay, yeah, because probably they become complex themselves. So right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? So so I have a, a quick question. So uh, so uh, for. Convex compact, can one relax the uh, condition of having Fuchsian ends to quasi Fuchsian ends or are they counter examples? Exactly. So thank you for asking that question. So that was actually my last two slides that I didn't have time to discuss. So uh, yeah. So, right, so we have a Fuchsian end and then for hyperbolic three manifold, when n is equal to three, there's a huge deformation space of this manifold. So which gives the hyperbolic three manifold with the quasi-Fuchsian end. 
Okay. And then for n uh, higher, uh, it's known that there is no such a thing. There's, a, there is no local deformation by a theorem of uh, Kirchhoff's term. And now, uh, so we also, with McMullen and Mohammadi, we also proved this uh, result theorem for this uh, uh, convex compact hyperbolic three manifold with the quasi function end. But this time, actually, it's not about the horror cycle, but we, uh, our theorem is about the geodesic planes. So, yeah. I see, I see. Okay, thanks. So, uh, geodesic plane corresponds to the orbit of a PSL2R, and then we showed that actually any geodesic plane is either closed or dense if you look at the interior of the convex core. And then uh, we were, in fact, uh, so we had a question whether one can replace this interior of the convex core by the total manifold, but uh, it's not true by the work of uh, Yonggu and Zhang. He showed that actually interior of the convex core is the right thing to look at in this uh, rigid theorem because uh, there is a count example if you replace uh, this interior of the core by the core or the, by the whole manifold. Yeah. So it's quite interesting because in the hyperbolic three manifold case, this rich theory of, uh, I mean, this uh, hyperbolic three manifold gives us actually this continuous family of this uh, uh, three manifold with crazy function end. And then all this, uh, I mean, Ragnarok's conjecture, uh, like at least, uh, I mean, uh, beyond the PSL2R, you only have countably many actually lattices in each group. So this all this theorem applies to only countably many family of lattices, I mean, uh, homogeneous spaces, but for hyperbolic three manifold, uh, in fact, it's surprising that we can prove this rigid theorem like uh, Ratner's or as in Ragnarok's conjecture for this continuous family of uh, yeah, hyperbolic three manifolds. So, so yeah, so it, this, I, I felt like this was a very nice somehow juncture between homogeneous dynamics with this low dimensional yeah, topology. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the question, yeah. Okay, is there any other question? Okay, if not, uh, let us thank uh, Professor Hee Ho oh, from, from Yale. It was nice to have her uh, very interesting talk. Uh, we, we have the next talk in a few minutes, so don't go away. Thank you very much, Professor. <laughs>